so our next session uh, was originally designed to be uh, just a, a, a little chat between a couple of people about the uh, astrophysics decadal survey, but there's just so much to talk about and so many people to talk about it, this became a full-fledged panel. Uh, so so we, we've got these folks setting up here and we're, uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing more about the, uh, about the decadal. And um, our moderator for this session uh, is Anne Kinney. Uh, Anne is Deputy Center Director of the Goddard Space Flight Center. So thank you and welcome. Thanks. Please. So um, what does NASA do as soon as it's had an outstanding, outrageous success that took, I, I would say 30 years, not 20. Well, it talks about what it's gonna do next. So that's what we're here to do. And uh, we have a really great group of people to do it. Um, one of the people on our little panel here uh, crafted the, uh, assignment to the National Academy, that's Paul Hertz. <laughs> and then two of the people were on the National Academy uh, membership to, uh, to decide and prioritize and so on. And that's Jane Rigby from uh, Goddard Space Flight uh, Center and Rachel Austin from Space Telescope Science Institute. So um, we're going to follow a, um, a kind of a methodology that Rachel said she used to think about the decadal, which I really liked. It was divided into minds, measurements, and machines. And we're gonna go in order from, let's see, is that left to right? Depends on where you, where you sit. Where you sit depends on where you stand, or is it the other way around? Minds is all about workforce and, you know, what are we gonna do about who is in this field? Um, uh, the second one is measurements, which is all about technology development of all sorts. And the third one is about mission machines, which is, of course, also missions. So I think Jane is going to start. Each of them has some thoughts to start, and then they are going to pose a question to their other panelists and anyone who feels like answering the question. So take it away, Jane. All right. No, you don't want to. Uh, Jane has a young child. Well, that's vaccinated. okay. He is so vaccinated. Oh my God, he's so vaccinated. I know, he's nine. Um, he even got to go see an IMAX movie to celebrate being vaccinated. Um, all right, so let's see. They wanted me to talk about, uh, so I was on the panel on the state of the profession and societal impacts. And so, and as was Patty Boyd, who's in the audience. Hi, Patty. Um, so let's see. Um, we started off on our panel talking about, um, we had an opening quote that I'm just gonna put out here because I think it really, it bears repeating, that the pursuit of science and scientific excellence is inseparable from the humans who animate it. Um, a lot of the framing about diversity and inclusion is as a, um, you know, is a good to have. And I think it, I hope it has emerged by now and is accepted by most of the STEM community that diversity and inclusion is inseparable, that if you don't have it, your science and your scientific excellence is suffering. Um, and you can think about that in terms of lost capacity, you can think about that in terms of a lot of ways, but, um, but for us, this was just a given that how do we stop squandering resources? How do we do a better job in future decades? Um, certainly there are uh, the metrics of progress, such as the number of PhDs granted to African-Americans and Hispanics in physics, show that those numbers, those rates increased at times when the agencies were spending money to diversify. Um, and so the, the decadal had recommendations to really re-up that commitment to workforce diversity. Uh, the, we had a very strong recommendation in the decadal to address harassment and discrimination, and to treat it as a form of research or scientific misconduct. And I would say personally, a real revelation for me on this work was realizing that the penalties are harsher for misusing data, for mistreating data, say for falsifying your data, than for mistreating your people. And I, that really has to change, right? That we have special penalties within science for faking data. I understand why, 
but it is equally bad to really hurt the people that are doing the work. Um, so I think that's really um, the other thing that was very striking, which we all knew, but you have to say it bluntly, is that the racial diversity within astronomy remains, the word that the decadal used was abysmal, which means a giant pit. That is about right. It is a factor of 10 underrepresentation uh, for African Americans and Hispanic individuals. So, you know, that's a factor of 10 underrepresentation of 4% versus uh, a plurality in the US population. Um, the other thing that I think really struck people that I wanted to highlight was a study that Joan Centrella did inferring gender of PIs for NASA programs. Um, there aren't demographics on that, so she inferred the gender from, uh, from first names. Uh, only 14% of the science, science teams of, of proposed missions had women. Um, only 14% of the science teams of those proposals were women. And 18 explorer class proposals had no inferred women in science roles, including science teams that have 28 members, and none of them are women. Um, and almost no female PIs, it's in the noise. So I think, so some clear recommendations that came out of that in the decadal is that we need to collect demographic data and we shouldn't be afraid of demographic data. And if that requires extra paperwork to get it, we should get it. And that agencies should consider the diversity of teams when awarding funding, missions, projects, and management of facilities. Um, and Paul can talk about how that's already happening. Um, so that's the opening statement, the sort of, um, do we want to each, so I think the, the sort of question for discussion here um, would be first riffing on those ideas. Um, but then I think the other question would be about how culture can change. Um, and in particular, how do we need to change the way we form science teams um, to be more intentional about inclusion rather than hiring our buddies, which kind of bakes in uh, the systemic inequities of, of the last, uh, you know, of the, that we all came up with. So, so I'll respond to that challenge. Uh, in the Science Mission Directorate, we are now um, requiring inclusion plans for some of our research proposals. And in these inclusion plans, we ask the PIs to lay out uh, how their group is inclusive, how they will uh, run their team in an inclusive manner, and how they will make sure that their team provides a safe and healthy workplace for all the members of their team, including the early career people and the, perhaps the, the uh, underrepresented people. Uh, last year, we only required this for one program. It was a pilot. We reviewed it. We gave the feedback. We learned how to do it. This year, we're requiring it in about half of all astrophysics programs and a smattering of programs across other areas of NASA science. And uh, we will review the inclusion plans uh, and PI, we will not use them for selection this year, but a unacceptable inclusion plan will have to be remedied by a PI if their proposal is selected before we will initiate funding. Next year, when we'll broaden this to uh, a much larger fraction of all the science programs at NASA, uh, anybody who submits an unacceptable inclusion plan will not have their proposal selected. So that's how we are going to uh, use the power of the purse to uh, incentivize uh, research PIs to improve the way they're running their research teams. Thanks. So at, at uh, Goddard, what we are doing is we have a program. Um, it's part of the NASA intern program. There's a NASA wide intern program that's really powerful. And we've taken lessons from our Hispanic, Hispanic advisory committee there, uh, which basically has a wrapping around the intern program to make sure that Hispanic interns are greeted that they know the community that they, they know the Hispanic community there in case they're surrounded by people who don't have the same accent than them. And we've applied that to African-American interns, which we've recruited very actively. And the, active, the African-American interns now have a wrapping around their internship where they have all these opportunities to meet each other and to meet the African-Americans on center who are very, very capable uh, scientists and engineers and program managers, et cetera, et cetera. 
We're in the second year of that program. We had almost 50 interns the first year, and we hope this will be a really serious onboarding for future STEM uh, minorities. Let's see. I, I don't oh, to that I, question. Yeah, I don't think I have anything specific to add. All right. So uh, the second area was, uh, as Ann called it, measurements. And the decadal survey placed an emphasis on enabling foundation or infrastructure that supports research. And they laid out an entire chapter with the necessary foundational capabilities needed for a thriving research enterprise. And a healthy research foundation is one that provides balance between the overall scientific productivity today and the future sustainability of the research enterprise. That is, you need to be generating science today, but you also need to be having some healthy seed corn for science tomorrow. The Decadal Survey, of course, identified areas that they thought were unhealthy and made recommendations that focused on those areas. They noted that the uh, selection rates for research proposals um, have been going down, and that's because the agency budgets do not keep up with the combined impact of inflation, plus the impact of a growing community. The number of, uh, the number of proposers is growing faster than inflation. And so the Decadal Survey recommended real growth in the uh, research budgets, real growth above inflation. The Decadal Survey also targeted areas that they thought were particularly needed for in increased investments. And those included theory, um, low TRL um, technology, that is uh, technology inception, uh, and laboratory astrophysics. Um, all of these areas have something in common. They're critical for in both interpreting our observations from great observatories like James Webb and for planning new missions like future great observatories. Um, they called out the balloon program for a standalone non-advocate review. Um, and the balloon program is one of these programs that punches above its weight. Um, it's, it's a modest amount of cost um, and it generates uh, um, a, a, a good handful of projects every year, sounding rockets and balloon projects. Um, and every one of those projects delivers science. Every one of those projects matures technology and every one of those projects matures the next generation of practitioners. Uh, and so uh, it's a really critical program, but we've done such a good job of creating uh, possibilities in the balloon program that we have to now make choices. Is it more important to do uh, long duration balloon programs from Antarctica, which are all in the daytime, or is it important to do super pressure balloon programs from mid latitudes where you get long, uh, long flights with lots of nights, or is it better uh, to do lots of the short one day flights you do domestically uh, because they are cheaper and easier and you can do more of them. So what's the right prioritization there? And finally, the Decadal Survey noted that the data archives need modernization. They called out better coordination between space and ground archives. Uh, but, but the other thing that we need to know in astrophysics is that we're about to enter the era of big data in astrophysics uh, on the ground with the Rubin Observatory from space with the Roman Space, uh, the Roman space Telescope. Uh, and so we need to uh, upgrade our archives to provide uh, cloud services so that uh, scientists can work on the data where the data is because they will not be able to download the data to their laptop in the future. So that, that's, that's the uh, foundational recommendations that I see in this decadal survey. So my question to my fellow panelists mm -hmm. is uh, you know, that, um, so most of the research and the research capabilities that we do are uh, proposal and peer review driven, that's bottom up. Um, but, uh, Nat, but the Decadal Survey recommends investments in specific areas, which is top down. How does NASA balance between peer review and the Decadal Survey? So I, I can take that since I was one of the people who wrote the Decadal. <laughs> um, I think one approach to addressing that is uh, to recognize that you want to be able to take advantage of the flowering of creativity that comes from individual PIs, but also address, direct that in a way so that, uh, and Paul, I think you made this point when you were um, directing the steering committee um, about probes, you said, 
it's, it's a waste of time to have a whole bunch of people writing proposals for these large projects when only a few will, will actually get selected. And so you implored us to, you know, if you want to recommend a probe, you didn't tell us that we had to, <laughs> we came up with that ourselves, but, but you, you provided some direction that, you know, being strategic about where you're going to put your money, where you're going to put your time and your resources um, is helpful to everyone. And so I think that that's a, a good way to marry the, the, the top down and the bottom up that you, you provide direction, you tell people, you tell the community what areas you're particularly interested in. And then, um, you know, there, we're talking about space here, but of course, the decadal survey was also recommending programs for the ground. And we struggled with this for the, on the, for the ground. And uh, one of the solutions that we came up with was to have a, um, a hybrid of, you know, completely open calls mixed with strategic calls where you're, you're, you're allowing for the, the great ideas that maybe don't fit in a box to be able to be uh, received and evaluated. But then you're also saying, okay, well, but these are some really, these are some important areas that we really wanna, really wanna make headway on. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. And I know that, you know, we have open calls for research proposals, uh, but then the peer reviews, one of the things they look at is how compelling, how important is the science? And the decadal survey sets some guideposts for what are the highest priorities, and that does influence peer reviewers uh, because they're not only judging the implement, implementability of research proposals, but also you know, how scientifically impactful will they be? How compelling are they? Mm -hmm. Scientific merit is the buzzword we use for that. Mm -hmm. I can riff in two directions on that. I wanted to go back just a minute to what, what an underscore all what you said about data. I think I keep telling people that web is the last small data mission. You know, at the end of the web mission, we can put all the data on a couple hard drives and walk out of the building because it, it has to be compressed so much to get from L2. I think I have most of the data so far that's come down and it easily fits on a hard drive, but that's so not true for Roman. And a question is how do we use that as an opportunity? The fact that all the data analysis has to happen in the cloud to build equity rather than, rather than magnify inequity, right? Because it's the richest universities and institutions that have the supercomputers. And so how do you use this as a way to democratize things in a way that the great observatories did instead of to build that in? Um, I was struck really in, in, in thinking about this balance between top down and bottom up by how most of the practitioners are on very short time scales in our field that most of the practitioners are, you know, they have a one to three year horizon because they're students or postdocs. And so, you know, I, I've given so many talks about web where it was just like, people like, yeah, I don't care. It's outside my event horizon, right? I gotta get a job in the next year. And so it was fun to then get into that where suddenly we were in people's cone and they, they cared about us, it was really fun, but it happened really late. And so for many of our practitioners, you know, they're driven to very short-term thinking because we have such a competitive field and because we have so many practitioners that are fairly junior. But it's the strategic missions that really, in many ways, drive the field forward. And so I was thinking about this in terms of the fact that a decadal process forces that sort of long-term vision that otherwise I think we would really be driven toward chasing the next dollar or ch chasing the next geo grant endlessly in a way that, that really would, would stagnate as a field. So I don't have a great answer for that, but I'm thinking about it in terms of the fact that most of our practitioners are on very, very short timescales because they don't know if they'll still be in the field in five years. So I, I think it's really important. I mean, that's, that's a great point. And uh, it, you know, some of the, obviously the missions we do take a long time. And some of the science problems we're addressing take a long time also. So uh, it's really important that there are jobs in our field that are have, have that security and that they're not three-year appointments always. And uh, there are other areas of NASA science where most of the field is on, is on soft money, which with uh, very short horizons in employment. And I think it's 
still a good thing that most of us astrophysics uh, is supported by people who have long-term appointments uh, in academia or elsewhere. Um, but if we ever start trending towards a balance towards short-term money, I think it will change the nature of the science that we're doing. All right, my turn. Uh, so I'm uh, Rachel Austin. I'm an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I was a member of the steering committee for the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. I was also the executive officer. So I saw a lot of the sausage getting made and I made some of the sausage. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna talk about that third leg of the stool that, that Anne mentioned. So there are mines, measurements and machines. One, um, one key takeaway point in coming up with that, that visualization, that graphic is how each of those three legs of the stool are important. You can't knock one away and still have a stool that works. You need, you need all of them. Um, so machines, right? Telescopes, facilities, uh, astronomers are really intimately tied to our machines. We need them to take the data for us. Our eyes are just not very good telescopes. Um, what counts as a telescope is expanding. It's not just electromagnetic radiation. Um, we're in the era of gravitational wave astrophysics. We're entering the domain of neutrino astrophysics. Um, that was one of the things that Decatur was very excited to, to comment on. Um, and, uh, and there's expanding technology for radio telescopes, infrared detectors, coronagraphs, X-ray telescopes. It's really, it's a, it's really amazing. Um, these machines cover a range of scales from, as Paul was mentioning, balloon-borne experiments to the flagship missions. And they're all important to move science and technology forward. One of the things that the report emphasized was how very integrated these different machines are in advancing the important science questions. You can't really, you can't answer the, the important questions without having access to a range or diversity of wavelengths. You need radio, you need infrared, you need x-ray, you need ultraviolet, you need optical. Um, so they're really, they're really tied together. And this is one of the legacies of the great observatories, uh, the previous great observatories. And that thinking, led the committee to the formulation of the recommendations that we, that we came up with. Um, the first, first one I want to point out is how building large facilities takes time, right? That, that's something that is, is obvious, but I think it needed to be stated and recognized. Um, you, we're not building the, the webs and the Romans and the Hubbles on decadal timescales, even though that's the timescale on which we're setting the priorities. Um, and, uh, and what that means is we need to do things differently. We need to think about ways to do things differently. Um, part, of the, part of that acknowledging the long time scale ties into to the, the mines, right? These are generational projects. Uh, they're not gonna be done by just one group of people. It's as we talked about in the previous session, it's, collecting the information, passing it along to the next generation who can then pass it along to the, to the people after that. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the key differences with this report compared to previous ones is that we, we explicitly avoided ranking the large projects that came, that came before us. There were four uh, mission concepts, three really independent um, ideas that came before us and we did not rank them. We did not say number one, number two, number three. Um, we said, it's not a winner take all. <laughs> we, it, we, all, we, we, all we all have to win. Um, we need a new approach. Uh, more technology development needs to occur earlier for previous, than, than it has for previous missions in order to bound the mission cost timeline and then have a better match with realizing the science questions that you want to address as those things are all in flux and changing. Um, you want to recognize uh, the ties to the workforce development, like I already said. Um, we uh, developed a concept of a great observatories mission and technology maturation program, which Paul told me he, we didn't think we didn't spend any time thinking about acronyms, and that's clearly a mouthful. <laughs> um, but the uh, the idea is that you you have entrance into this 
program that developed the technology and then sort of, you know, they're able to exit that program with a very well-defined cost timeline budget. Um, and, uh, and you can do this in a way that you can phase multiple, multiple flagships at the same time. So the report was really taken with the idea that we can within, within some of our lifetimes um, uh, determine if there are potentially habitable planets around sun-like stars, Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. And we can do that with the technology that we have today. Um, so the report uh, had the first entrant in this great observatories program be a six meter infrared optical UV telescope that would be capable of uh, basically suppressing the light of a, of a star to a level of about one in 10 billion and be able to take spectra of planets around that star. The second and third entrants in this program are a far infrared and X-ray flagship, which as I mentioned before, you need that complementarity uh, of wavelengths in order to do, to do the science. Uh, and this is a way that, that has phased reviews, uh, phased development with, with gate reviews. So it's not a winner take all approach. Um, the projects can, if they have not enabled their technology in sufficient amount of time, then we can pass the baton to the next, the next mission that's in development. Um, another, another component of what the report advocated was uh, establishing a probe line. I mentioned that earlier. Um, that's to fit in the gap between the explorers and the flagship missions. Um, we recognize that even within the, the previous great observatories, there was a fairly large dynamic range in, in mission cost. And um, by instituting a probe line, we can cover the, the wavelength gaps instead of having to wait 20, 30 years for the next infrared flagship. We can have uh, more focused capabilities, but on shorter timescales. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to bring out was, as, a, as I mentioned at the very beginning, where we're, we're, not, we're not just doing electromagnetic observations anymore, uh, it's very important um, to understand the time domain that's driving many of the current missions, it's gonna be continue to be important through the decade. And the uh, committee came up with this idea of a time domain program um, for space, which is, it's not recommending a mission. It's, it's basically saying we want a, a committee of scientists to advise NASA on what the current uh, forefront science questions are and, and give them advice on how to do that. It could be that with an array of um, smaller scale uh, explorer missions that you could, you could cover the, the proposed science. Maybe, maybe you need something that's a bit larger that's more of a, a probe class, um, but that we didn't wanna predetermine that uh, at the time of the writing of the report, we wanted it to be a dynamic, um, a dynamic program and something that would be sustained in the same way that the probe line and this Great Observatories Mission Technology Development Program are sustained. So they're, they're, they, the plan is that they last for longer than the decade. Uh, so I um, question I have for Jane and Paul to, to react to is one of the common elements of those three things is the, is the sustaining nature of them, that they last for, uh, for past the decade. What obstacles do you foresee in achieving that? I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. Um, so the first, the, I'll give you, a pro, you know, the first problem is money. The second problem is money. And the third problem is money. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the budgets are always limited, whatever they are, they're constrained and you can't do everything first. So I think the, the biggest challenge is uh, time ordering your big investments, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we just received the Decatur survey back in November. Um, it did obviously didn't influence this year's budget and the next year's budget will be released next week and the Decatur survey barely influenced it, um, but it will fully influence, fully inform the 24 budget when we formulate it. And so one of the things that we have to think through is, you know, what do we invest in now and what do we put off till later? Um, do you just do a little bit of everything or do you go big on something first and, and you know, defer everything else? So I think that's, 
that's the challenge. I don't think sustaining is a problem. I think starting is the challenge. Give in part a sociological answer. Um, there is always a temptation to circle the wagons and fight inward, you know, and that's never good. There is a temptation to think about budgets, uh, to think about it as a zero sum game, which is once the budget has been made, but it, but great ideas could bring more money to the program. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something where I see so much enthusiasm for the astrophysics that we're doing, for the big questions that we're working on. And, you know, some of that is, you're seeing that with web. People are really, really excited, both because it's technically hard and because the science that we're gonna be able to do is just way cool. So there's a ton of enthusiasm. How do we capitalize on that? And then how do we sustain that? Part of that is communication, authentic communication. Um, and part of that is, is getting that message out. And part of it is having faith that if we put our great ideas forward, we can, we can, those will be compelling arguments for the folks that decide the funding levels. I agree, agree a hundred percent. A great decadal survey will uh, create great future budgets. So um, that was 29 minutes. Oh, <laughs> amazing. We have uh, time for a question. <laughs> can you just shout it out? No, because it won't work online. Uh, Help us on the way. Help us on the way. First off, that was an excellent presentation, and thank you for that. Um, just going back to Jane's point about diversity and inclusion, I thought it might be a good idea to just something I throw out there, uh, spend more time going into the colleges to try and universities and trying to interest people, at, you know, students at a younger age to get them more interested in science. And uh, by doing so, you could also diversify by uh, spreading out to various races, women as well as men, the, you know, the sexes, things like that. Um, it just might put their attention and be a good idea. And I know a lot of that's being done, but outreach seems to be an excellent way to foster interest in science and in NASA. That's it, that's it. We, I agree completely. The, uh, at the, this year, the fiscal year 22 budget includes $5 million for uh, the science mission director to begin a bridge program, bridging between uh, colleges and universities that uh, um, our minority serving and into the NASA system so that we can uh, reach out to those students and uh, give them internships, give them uh, training, and, and eventually give them jobs and bring them into our community. Yeah, so I, on, that, on that note, one of the things that the report called out is just how incredibly successful um, historically black colleges and universities and other minority serving institutions have been in uh, recruiting and developing the talent of underrepresented minorities. I think HBCUs, I don't remember what the exact statistic is, but they're just powerhouses of, of turning out um, mass uh, uh, STEM, STEM degrees for people who are, you know, don't look like most of the people in this room. And so uh, finding ways to, to develop programs that encourage that, expand it, um, is, is a sort of obvious starter point for me. Unless there's anything else, uh, uh, we're out of time. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you.